mailing. Right now, free speech is under heavy attack in New Zealand and overseas, with governments constantly devising new ways to enforce censorship. To make sure you never miss the critical news and breaking stories you rely on, join the RCR mailing list today. Get connected now at realitycheck.radio forward slash email. Dr. Mariwa Glover has been at the forefront of tobacco policy for more than 30 years. She is undeniably a world-class expert on the topic. And with it being in the news a lot at the moment, I thought we'd get her along to help you all understand the forces at play regarding tobacco control. She's also been cancelled because she refuses to follow groupthink and has contrarian views on the issue. Let's talk with Dr. Clover now and find out her views on what is going on in the industry and what policies we should be pursuing to get New Zealand smoke-free. Dr. Mari Glover, welcome to The Crunch. How are you this afternoon? Great. The sun has just come out and that, that makes everything better, doesn't it? <laughs> it always does. <laughs> now, you're one of New Zealand's... Uh, well, I'm trying to work out a, a, a suitable explanation because it's a it's a it's a very warped world that you um, operate in. You know, in talking about smoking cessation and uh, the research around all of uh, you know tobacco products and tobacco marketing and smoking cessation, it all seems a bit emotive. But you're one of the the people who spends an awful lot. Of, in fact, all of your time researching this. Yes, and for such a long time now, 31 years, and so... Well, I it's first... a good word then, isn't it? Yes. <laughs> studying something. That's Dr. right. Bradwell would say you've done more than your 10,000 hours, and uh, therefore you're an expert. Thank you. I, I have certainly have done more than 10,000 hours and feel like I've done more than that just in the last year. There's a lot to do, and we're unfortunately... It's just become so contested, such a um, vicious field. And when I started, it was all about reducing death and disease, you know, and that was the focus. And it's completely shifted away from that, you know, very similar to many other issues with the culture war and wokeism and all sorts of other stuff coming into it. It's, it's just so disappointing to have been you know, at the forefront of tobacco control, of reducing smoking in New Zealand and to see what the sector has dissolved into. Well, I've been watching it for quite some time. Um, I took an interest in back in my old whale oil days at uh, what seemed to be a group of people that were activists rather than scientists and were using a motive and erroneous studies to push an agenda which seemed to be for total prohibition. And and I can recall even giving evidence once at a select committee and was roundly abused by Shane Bradbrook, who was sitting behind me, uh, Hane Harawira, who was an MP at the time, sitting in front of me. And I was pointing out that after 10 years of all these smoking cessation programs, um, this is about 10 years ago, so it's dated since then. We've had the advent of, you know, um, vaping and all those sorts of things. And I was pointing out that in 10 years of smoking, smoking cessation efforts and the expenditure of hundreds of millions of dollars, that there was still the same number of smokers as there were 10 years ago. Yes, we we did have a plateau, Um you know, so there was initial reduction in smoking prevalence in New Zealand from its peak. Its peak was like in the mid-1960s, and then the U.S. Surgeon General's report came out in 1964, was broadcast globally, uh, you know, and those people who actually had a black and white TV then, I think they were black and white, um, got to get the message about smoking kills and we began to see then a reduction very slow people began to give up for health reasons those that could and uh, another paper that a colleague and I have produced modeled like if that kept going and 
the old adage that if parents smoke, children are more likely to smoke. And if someone, you know, quits, then you're more likely to quit. We modelled that. And actually that initial kind of shock of that knowledge coming out explains all of the reduction in the following years up until pre, pre-vaping mm-hmm. as we went up to vaping. So it's very interesting perspective because modelling is very respected, especially if you think back to COVID and the modelling that happened and, you know, we don't have to get into what is the weaknesses of modelling. But but that initial knowledge, knowledge is what people need. They need facts, they need the truth, uh, and that needs to be based on robust, good scientific evidence. And they need support, you know, if that's what they want, if that's what they want to do, if it is harming them and they don't want that, then they need to have that option there. It's not forcing everybody into it. It's you've got to work with people. Yeah, exactly. I mean, I I was sitting there watching uh, successive governments. It didn't matter which government was in. They were hell-bent on increasing taxation mm. for cigarettes. And I went to a conference on smoking cessation in Singapore and I learned some very interesting stuff there. I think it was about 2012. So it's, you know, 12 years ago, again, before vaping. And they talked about Bhutan and how Bhutan is uh, tried taxing cigarettes out of existence. And it got to a certain point where it became lucrative for criminal gangs to sell illegal cigarettes because the taxation was so high. And I warned the select committee back then that, you know, and I even said to them, look, if you want a 40-foot container of um, illegal cigarettes delivered here, you just got to give me $50,000 in cash and I'll have it here in two hours. And they, they just laughed at me and they couldn't believe that it could happen. But it does happen and it, and it is happening. But we've seen successive governments slap on taxes on top of uh, on tobacco, on, on excise, uh, increasing it every year almost. And we're at now a point where... We're seeing uh, dairies and supermarkets and and service stations being robbed for cigarettes. It's the Bhutan situation all over again, and I can't believe we fell into that. Yes, it's um, the global tobacco control sector continue to say that taxation is the most effective uh, lever to get people to stop smoking. I, I think that it's you have to be very brave to challenge sort of ideas that, you know, they, they kind of hold them up. If you disagree, then watch out, you're probably gone, <laughs> which um which I found out because I I disagreed. I said that's enough tax. And this is going back um 13, 14 years, uh, I could see through the studies I was doing with Māori low income, with young pregnant mums, uh, and through other research I did on obesity, that the price of cigarettes was causing people to, you know, they spend it there, they don't have it then to spend on food, on healthy food, you know, they can still buy fish and chips or big pile of, you know, fish and chips and everyone will be happy. But um, the taxation was beginning to harm the level of that's coming out of people's pockets. So I I like put my hand up. I'm like, no, that's enough. This needs to stop. Uh, thankfully, the Ministry of Health did do uh, commission an evaluation and they I think it was EY went out. Uh, they they came back and they said the same thing. Yep, this is definitely harming people, and uh, and that's when I guess around about the time that Labor, the Labor government got in, Labor New Zealand First coalition, and they stopped the tax for a while. You still have the CPI and you know annual inflation adjustment, but um, I see the tax is going to go back on again. Well, politicians are addicted to tax. I, I said to the select committee at the time, if you guys were serious about uh, s- tobacco cessation or cigarette smoking cessation, New Zealand's a very small country. You could make it illegal right now. We've got um, pretty strong borders. You need a boat to get here. It would be 
pretty easy to shut everything down. There's no land routes that people can get around customs or whatever. You have to be very determined to get stuff in. And yes, there would still stuff be getting in, but if they were serious about it, instead of taxing people, something like, I think it was back then, it was about $1.4 billion. It's more than that per annum now. And that would, you know, if it was about health, they'd do that. And not one of them said anything. They had no answer. They're, yeah. they're, that's kind of a breach of human rights, though. Um, it, it's, you know, I don't agree with prohibition. I don't agree with just banning something. And uh, it, it's there still would be a black market. I mean, Australia is a very good, you know, we're getting plenty of evidence over there because they've banned, you know, e-cigarettes. If you want if you want to vape, you've got to go to the pharmacy to get, and you've got to get a prescription. Oh, you don't need a prescription anymore, but you've got to go to the pharmacy. The pharmacies don't even want to sell them. So, they, yeah, the black market ballooned, as I warned, as you, you know, warned, as many people warned. Um, and then uh, that's another study I've done in the last five years was um, an analysis of the RAM raids of shops Uh these things create other health problems. So there were a hundred injuries in the numerous media articles that I read about the ram raids, and a hundred people had been injured physically, let alone psychologically. Uh, one, two men, I think, had lost an eye. Um, you know, others had been slashed up their arm with a machete, and there was a young Maori boy who was involved in robberies. Um, drove up the motorway the wrong way, got chased, ended up s slamming into a pole and dying. Another, And then, of course, we had a retailer murdered, uh, killed. In. So <laughs> policy analysis, you have to look at the potential negative consequences. And if you're going to do something, and that just creates other harms in another area of public health, uh, that's inappropriate and you have to balance everything out. Prohibition's never worked anywhere in the world, has it, on anything, whether it's drugs or alcohol or cigarettes. It's never worked. So smoking was uh, banned in our prisons. That's some time ago now as well. And I guess everyone would go, well, it wouldn't work there either. They made it that it was quite different from other prisons who had tried this around the world in New Zealand, you're not allowed to take tobacco onto the whole premises, not even the staff and right. no visitors either. Nobody's allowed to take tobacco on there. Um, I, I knew the person who did the initial evaluation and they had to sort of take some stuff out. They said, well, if that's the case, I'll take my name off it as well. So we don't get to hear the real story. Um, I have some research participants in my current study who have been been in there and come out and, and there's been some very interesting stories from people who have actually been in prison and what's going on. The creative things they can do with a patch, which I won't go into um, for the sake of the public's ear. <laughs> oh, there's many creative things that they can do, but it, the fact is, is that uh, all sorts of contraband gets smuggled into prisons. And tobacco would be no exception to that. I mean, they already smuggle cannabis in there. They already smuggle methamphetamine in there, mm. uh, even smuggle cell phones in. So if you can smuggle a cell phone in, you can sm smuggle in some uh, loose-leaf tobacco, can't you? Yeah, and yes, there was that lawyer that was visiting. I got, in, got involved with someone in prison, and she she smuggled in tobacco, got caught. Do you remember that story anyway? Her name, first name was Davina, if I know, if I remember correctly. Mm, mm. So it's you know stories like that. We know what you're saying is right. So prohibition doesn't work, but but in after the 2020 election, when Labor were a majority government and didn't have Winston, uh, Winston Peters sitting there uh, providing a handbrake, they pretty much went full on uh, full on uh, prohibition, but. In, in a sneaky kind of ways, you know, they talked about having an age ban, um, talked about something that doesn't even exist, uh, that they were going to force on the entire world somehow. You know, this little old New Zealand, a small country that has a very small numbers for, for anything that we do, um, rounding figures basically for large corporates. But they were suggesting that 
that um, tobacco companies be forced to sell denicotinized or low nicotine tobacco, which doesn't exist. And somehow they were going to enforce that. And then the stupidity of trying to reduce retailers down to around 600 across the whole of New Zealand. Yes, that was uh, pretty shocking. So those policies have been talked about in New Zealand tobacco control and, you know, for quite some time. I mean, they, it's it's kind of like, you know, brainstorm and throw up any idea, no matter how extreme, no matter how weird. And, and those ideas were there, but they were seen by many people as, yeah, no, that's really extreme. That That isn't pragmatic. It's never going to happen. Uh, when we had um, Ayer Chevrel, who came from University of Otago into Parliament, uh, they they had one of their own in there then, and she became Associate Minister of Health. And that actually had been talked about as a strategy as well, you know, that we need to get our own people into Parliament. So there's all these strategies, lobbying, advocacy strategies, how do we manipulate politicians that have been talked about within the sector for a long time. Uh, there's a lot of strategizing that goes on rather than actually going out and helping people stop smoking. Isn't that what they accuse Big Tobacco of doing? Oh, well, you know, we learned so much from Big Tobacco. We learned, we learned, you know, tobacco control, the ones that spend most a lot of their time just doing lobbying rather than, as I said, helping people stop smoking. We've learned all of that from big tobacco. And it just does my head in that now I'm seeing that the sector that I've worked in for so long have adopted many of those old strategies that that were wrong wrongly used by, you know, big companies lobbying uh, government and bribing and, you know, giving payments or whatever. And here's tobacco control doing many of the same thing, using communication, you know. Uh, it's propaganda, basically, um, that manipulating the public perception, putting misinformation out there, which is like this is why many people are not watching, you know, mainstream media anymore, right, because you can't believe anything they say. It's There's so much false information, fake information, and very cleverly worded, um, you know, rhetoric. Uh, and that's what tobacco control went more for and have, you know, um, they've... <laughs> It's a, it's interesting because you, t you talk about the mainstream narrative out there. And just this week, we've seen uh, Radio New Zealand via Guy and Espiner mm. attack on Casey Costello, the minister, uh, with some fanciful numbers. I don't know if you've, you've seen that, but they're suggesting that, uh, that, that the government set aside $216 million dollars uh, as a fund to cover tobacco tax cuts. Uh, and we're talking about the tax cuts on heated tobacco products. And and if you analyse those Treasury numbers, and, and clearly Guy and Espiner didn't, uh, he just went round with the headline that there's this $216 million fund to cover tobacco tax cuts. But how you, I don't know how you're supposed to cover tax cuts. Tax cuts are taking less money, not, you don't need to fund it. But anyway, that's another argument. But it was this fanciful number, 216 million. And what Treasury's assumed is that uh, the there's 6,000 existing users of heated tobacco products. That, that will only increase by 1,200 to 7,200. But in order for those numbers to work for Treasury, that means that those 7,200 users of heated tobacco products would now have to buy 3,805 packets of 20 heats per user, right, per annum, and then use 209 of those a day. Well, yeah, I saw that cabinet paper, and I think that, you know, some of the money that's set aside is actually to pay the Ministry of Health for the work that they 
you know, so it's it's their budget to work on this policy, so and they said that you know. Last- um, saying that they were going to lobby the government and and come up with reports that that had Jimmy numbers in it to justify them um, telling the government not to do this because um, it would be cheaper just to keep the tax in place. Yeah, that's it's disgusting the breakdown in both uh, universities, academia, and in the ministries, the government ministries. The as Liz Truss in the UK calls it or talks about it in her book, uh, The Blob, you know, officials now run everything. And if and they they have such a low opinion of politicians, of you know, people who get into parliament, MPs, um, and the the disgusting attacks on uh, you know, Karen uh short yesterday or in that select committee. I mean, th- this is across the board, this. You've been subject to those attacks as well because you don't sing from the same song sheet. That's right, yes. it's um, It really it really changed probably about 15 years ago to this new strategy of discrediting people, putting out uh, misinformation about them, manipulating people's perceptions of you. You know, it felt like my identity had been stolen and and then they just... They just lie. They just, you know, defame you. They they lie. They gossip. They uh, it's so unprofessional. It's so unethical, uh, and it frightens everyone. Somebody said to me recently that you've got to be careful in New Zealand because if you say the wrong thing, you'll get mad. Edward, you know, <laughs> so. It has a chilling effect. Again, another strategy we learned from the big tobacco companies, the chilling effect is if anyone who works in public health happens to say anything in support of these greatly risk-reduced products that thankfully the new government are supporting uh, and that, you know, the approach of the new government is we're going to get to 5% and we're almost there now. we are almost there i'm i'm it, you know it really has completely exceeded my expectations and we've mainly had people switching to vaping or or they switch to both smoking and vaping and then to vaping and you know whether they could or not i'm not really that concerned about that again you know i'd get mad at for that but what what we need to focus on is that it is smoke that kills. If you're not smoking, I'm cool with that. Let's move on to the next major disease, predominant disease that is causing harm. We shouldn't be wasting taxpayer dollars chasing down something that the harm is way, way down the list of priorities. If you, if you look at it too, yeah, the numbers of people smoke, smoking now, I mean, I gave that, um, when I was giving evidence to the select committee, I think there was about 750,000 smokers back then. You know, that was 2012. That seems about right, doesn't it? Yeah. Now I'm told the numbers are something like 290,000. Yeah. yeah. A significant drop. Yeah. Very short amount of time and it hasn't been done because of taxation has it it's been done because there's alternatives that are less harmful than cigarettes so people are moving from cigarettes to vaping or patches or gum or whatever you you choose to use to 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 get off smoking cigarettes and therefore there's much less harm happening much less uh impost on the health system and yet these public health advocates like um, you know, Dr. Jude Ball, for example, from the University of Otago, uh, are implacably opposed to even like nicotine pouches. Yes. They, they, they want to have those, you know, instead of being legalised and freely available for people to stop smoking altogether and to wean themselves off nicotine by using these pouches, like, you know, there's various different brands out there, but the largest brand in is Zinn. Um, there's also Snooze as well. They're opposed to all of these. 
and, and I'm struggling to understand why. Why are they opposed to these? I mean, you don't get cancer from nicotine, do you? No, no, you don't. It's, um, you know, there's lots of discussion about what are the motivations behind uh, these, you know, mainly academics who are saying these things. And, and there are there are multiple motivations. Some some of them they're uh, in it for the money, the gravy train of just you know continuing to have to treat cancer and research smoking related diseases and and the problem of people smoking. Oh, what are we going to do? Some of them, you know, they they have religious beliefs. The body's a temple. Uh, you shouldn't put anything into it. Uh, some of them, it's it's uh, the ideology is even worse. And there are crossovers across a number of topics that you cover on your show. You know, there are people in public health who believe that everybody should do what they say because the public generally are dumb. That's they honestly have very low respect for the public. They haven't done what I've told them to do. They're not, they're hurting themselves. And they I'm gonna tell them this is how you have to live. And then you won't get these diseases anymore. And you're to do what I say or else. And there are people in there that, that are quite extreme um one of those who I've I've um, you know danced in a courtroom with is Professor Boyd Swinburne, and he was a, a anti-smoking person to start with. Then he moved into nutrition and health, and now he's out there advocating for every tax he can think of um, around taxes on on soft drinks, taxes on sugar, taxes. All he ever talks about is tax, tax, tax. Uh, it's like it's the only thing he knows. Um, mm. Doesn't actually address some of the other, and other things that are out there, like you know, and I, given a, if I'd been given a chance, I would have said to him, "Well, hang on a second, you, you want to tax nicotine products? There's nothing wrong with nicotine. Um, nicotine helped me recover from a stroke." And everyone, everyone says to me, How, "What do you mean, Cam?" And I said, "Well, when I was in hospital after my stroke, I researched what causes strokes, and the largest uh, cause of stroke is." It's a combination of things, but if you have a lack of neuroplasticity, then the increased blood pressure just causes those blood vessels to fracture and break, which causes a stroke. So I thought to myself, well, how do you increase neuroplasticity? Well, the single the single thing that has the biggest impact on positive outcomes for neuroplasticity is nicotine. <laughs> So, so I was lying there in the hospital going, well, where am I going to get some nicotine? I don't like cigarette smoking. I hate it. Uh, so, you know, patches just seemed a bit gay. Um, <laughs> so I thought, well, I know, I'll start smoking cigars because you don't actually smoke cigars. And there's as much nicotine in one cigar as there is in a packet of cigarettes. So I just started smoking a cig one cigar a day. And then guess what? I found that the FDA in the United States has released several reports, peer-reviewed reports, saying that smoking one to two cigars a day has negligible health, negative health effects. Well, the the effect of smoking cigarettes or tobacco, it, there's a dose response. You know, the the more you smoke, the greater the risk. The earlier you start, the more you smoke, the longer you smoke, uh, the greater the risk. So, uh you know, historically in tobacco control, that kind of message was too complicated to put out, you know, to the public. They might go, oh, well, if I only smoke a little bit, then that's, you know, I'm at less risk. Oh, no, no, we can't have that. So it just became just tell people it kills. And uh, across all communications, you know, the, we had to just sort of hide the fact there's this dose response. So people who smoke more are at greater risk and cigar you know, people don't tend to smoke cigars you know as well, frequently not 20 a day right well, no, not inhaled so mm. you're not going to smoke 20 a day at 50 bucks each <laughs> you're just not <laughs> <laughs> well it, it's i guess it's that sort of 
some things are a luxury good. Um, but getting back to what you were saying about the heated tobacco product and vaping, you know, vaping has turned out to be an almost perfect substitute. It's like, and this has happened many, many times before with many products where people were using something, a new product comes along. It's almost like, you know, the camera uh, mm. and the phone, mobile phones. It's um, You can take photos on, what was it? Digital, you know. So it's in technological innovation. There's been a lot of product development, obviously, and the early ones, you didn't work for everyone and now what we have, the situation we have now is governments uh, and states in the US, they're fiddling around with regulating this thing or that product characteristic or this product characteristic. And they are destroying one of the things that made it an effective substitute. So if you take flavors away, you take away one of the characteristics of the product that has helped people to completely uh, so substitute. Disgusting, right? I mean, they do. They taste horrible. So if you've got an option to, to get a nicotine hit and it tastes like strawberry, you're going to take that, aren't you, over sucking on a cigarette? <laughs> well, there's a lot of people that's, especially initially, I mean, it is important to have a tobacco-flavoured mm. vape e-liquid as well because uh, the current study I'm writing up, uh, one of the barriers is that it's just too distant for many people, especially older people who have smoked for, you know, over 40 years. And this new innovative product it, and then the flavours, it, it's too, it's just too no. foreign. Yeah. So there's got to be a bridge. There's got to be something that's not so foreign. The other thing that really helped was kind of it still had the hand-to-mouth movement. Uh, it, it actually still had the performative aspect. What I mean by that is the creating, blowing out yeah, yeah. You know, a cloud. So there were so many similar things, characteristics and experiences and and so it really it really worked. We had this mass exodus of people around the world switching without any encouragement. And New Zealand is very different because the government encourages people who smoke to switch to vaping. In many countries, there's no encouragement. In fact, or it's hostile. It's, it's hostile, like Australia, which is going very extreme. And still, you can't stop humanity from understanding this is known to be harmful. I've seen it in my own Farno family. You know, I've seen people die of smoking-related diseases. This is known to be 95% safer. Okay, that's a fairly logical, common-sense thing to do then, isn't it? So uh, well, there, there doesn't seem to be any logic. I mean, it's a, you mentioned Australia and you've got to get it from a pharmacy which is highly ironic because when cigarettes first started coming around, you had to get them prescribed and get them from a pharmacy. <laughs> really? Yeah. I've seen it in museums, packets of cigarettes, you know, um, uh, inhale this to assist with your asthma. Oh, yes, yeah. You know, that sort of stuff. So, mm. um, you know, it was, it was medically prescribed. And so now you've got vaping. But that's not working, though, is it? No, and the... You know, strangely, they didn't seem to have consulted with that pharmacy guild, and they don't want to stock vaping products. They don't want to. I mean, that we had ram raids and violent robberies. Australia, they're firebombing the stores, and it's it's just astounding the level of crime over there that has occurred is far greater than what. Yeah, you know, there've been more people killed, and it's just. Uh, I think the officials who advise MPs, I think that whole system needs to be carefully transitioned to evidence-based. Yeah, uh, and also, it's like they don't understand what it means to be a public servant. 
they're in there pushing their own ideologies, whether they, you know, they back Greens or they back Labour or they back National. Uh, I saw it when I worked for the Public Health Commission. If there's a change of government, you get this ripple down from the top. So the top person will be replaced by the latest government's person that they want in. And then people people will be, oh, I don't support that government, so, you know, they'll go get another job or, or they are moved out. Um, so every time we get a change of government, there's this ripple of turnover in staff and in, in people in there and experts. We lose expertise and... And now it's just free for all, you know, in, in corporations and businesses and government agencies. It's just free for all. You you push your own ideology. They're doing, they're lobbying, like you said. They they're producing false information and writing it in such a way to manipulate a new MP. Uh, the reason that University of Otago, who who pushed those denicotinization, age ban, and and retailer licensing programs for years, decades they pushed those things. And how did they get them in? Because you've got a new government, they've got a majority, and a lot of them are newbies. They've never been an MP before. I invited uh, Janet Hoke onto this show to talk about this sort of thing, just refused flat out. You know, I said, well, hang on, you're a public... Um, health advocate, I want to talk about this. I want to explore your evidence on these statements that you're making. She didn't want to talk about it. A public servant, a public servant, academics have a duty to respond to requests like that. There's a number of countries around the world that have had different approaches. We've we've just talked about Australia, and their approach really isn't working mm. at all. Two com- countries come to mind in my research on this. Sweden is one of them, uh, and you've recently released a report comparing Sweden with New Zealand. We'll talk about that in a minute. Before we talk about Sweden, I want to talk about Japan, mm. right? Because in Japan, I mean, I'm, my father was involved in business around Asia an awful lot. So as a young person, I was brought up having Japanese businessmen come to our house or Korean businessmen, and and and. Those two countries in particular had a high incidence of cigarette smoking. That's my memory of every Japanese person who came and stayed at our place would prodigiously smoke. Men, right? Men. Yep, prodigiously smoke. And so they've got an endemic situation with cigarette smoking in Japan. In fact, one of the biggest tobacco companies companies in the world is in Japan, right? It's owned by the Japanese government. That's right. But they introduced heated products, which is what Guy and Espiner is all heated about. And as a result, from my research, and you're the expert, so you correct me if I'm wrong here, but it appears they've had a third cut in cigarette sales in three years. Three years. Yeah, it's uh, actually heated tobacco products have been on sale. They're a little bit longer than that. They're down 40%. So, yeah, it's substitute the market now. Forty percent of people who were smoking have gone to to the heated tobacco product. Um, this is also a product that is legal in New Zealand, but nobody knows about it in New Zealand because advertising of tobacco products is banned. Oh. So we we've actually had it here as well. Uh, the Ministry of Health tried to say that it was illegal took Philip Morris to court for selling the heat sticks and Judge Butler th- threw the case out. Uh, he said, but this is a product that reduces harm, is a reduced harm product. This goes against the whole purpose of the Smoke Free Environments Act, which is to reduce harm. So that was a milestone case uh, and it led to the next amendment to the Smoke Free Environments Act, changing the purpose of the Smoke Free Environments Act. So that's what they do. If they, oh, don't like that, well, we'll change the law. Um, But, yes, so heated tobacco products have been for sale here, but no advertising. 
vaping is the one everybody knows about. Uh, I've I only just saw my fir- the first person I've seen in New Zealand using a heated tobacco product just this week or last week. And from only one six, to- only six thousand users of heated tobacco products out of the two hundred and eighty odd thousand people smoking. Yeah. So they're sold in vape shops and I I guess it's it's just an accident. I suppose if someone is bu- is buying vape products, then they might come across them and uh ask what's this, you know. I mean there was restrictions put on vape shop uh anyone selling vape products. So they're not allowed to talk about they're not allowed to support people to stop smoking and say, well, you know, because it used to be that the person would say, oh, this isn't working for me or in the, in the vape, specialist vape stores used to give advice because they'd often been through it themselves and then they changed the law and stopped them from communicating and supporting people and providing that kind of, well, you could try this and I did this and, you know, they're allowed to talk about the product and that's it. They're not allowed to give any advice on how to actually you know, go through that cessation process and all of the things that a, a quit coach, for example, uh, or a counsellor could do, but probably better because it's a peer, peer-to-peer support rather than someone who thinks they're better. So if we look at the Japan situation, freely available anywhere, heated tobacco products, large uptake, 40% reduction in cigarette sales as a result, why aren't we copying them? It's, uh, I guess, because the heated tobacco products. So the first thing that happened was that's a Philip Morris. Uh, they they created the um, Icos uh, brand and then trialed it in a number of markets. So it's a tobacco product. It's a tobacco company product. So in New Zealand, uh, tobacco control, you know, how they feel about a tobacco company, uh, and they've now extended that out to be any tobacco company, any vape industry, independent vape industry company, anyone who happens to have a relationship with anybody that works in a tobacco company or a vape industry company. And they, and they've just widened the circle out to include anyone, anyone who says anything positive about these products uh, would be considered now tobacco industry by the attack on me then. After yes. the- <laughs> yeah, but uh, yeah, I don't care. <laughs> they can attack me all they like. I think we just need to look at evidence, and we- Japan is is evidence. It's real evidence. Yeah, Sweden is even more impressive, isn't it? Well, actually, before you move on to Sweden. Uh, so after what happened in Japan, so they had the ICOS and then British American Tobacco, another major tobacco company in the world. They bought out their own ver- brand of a heated tobacco product. And so Japan Tobacco, owned by the government, what do they do? And they're like, oh, we've got to get in on this. They created a very clever device. Uh, and I've actually been to Japan to study this uh and met with the Minister of Finance. He knows all about vaping. The the issue with Japan was they had a historical law banning uh, nicotine in other products. So they couldn't have vaping. And he he said it would take six years of enormous amount of lobbying and educating. They have a huge government to get that law changed. It's popular because it's already in tobacco. It's already in the law. Therefore, they can roll this out. That's right. And they couldn't have vaping. They can't have vaping. So vaping, uh, nicotine, you can vape without nicotine, but that's pretty, you know, useless. Um, so vaping with nicotine is is banned in Japan due to an historical law. So that's what we see there. Now, Korea copied, and they also experienced a rapid drop in smoking prevalence and a shift from cigarettes. They The government there used to own their kg I think it was called, a Korean tobacco company, but they, they privatised it some time ago. I think they still get a dividend. I don't, you know, but uh, so they came out with their own brand as well. 
the drop in cigarette sales was so rapid, the Korean government stepped in and started to say, oh, actually, these are harmful. They had to slow it down because they were losing so much money. It's like they bank on that tax coming in. And if you're just overnight going to lose it, not so much an issue in New Zealand because of the lower numbers of smoking, but in a country like Korea, uh, you lose that in in a rapid way. It's just suddenly gone. You're going to have a huge hole in your budget from the loss of tax. So the government stepped in and slowed it down. However, you can't you can't stop people from learning and making these healthy choices for themselves. And so it's just continuing. They also have experienced massive drop. We never hear about Korea and Japan because it's a heated tobacco product. Uh, Sweden had snus historically. It's a um, it's using tobacco. It's pasteurized, so it's boiled, yep. and that removes a lot of the toxins and the carcinogens. You don't smoke it though, do you? No, it's no, it's then pasteurized down and it used to just be put in the in in the mouth under the top lip between the gum and your cheek on its own just bundled up a bundle of it and then eventually you know it was put into a small cloth bag um and then so snus alone way before the introduction of vaping heated tobacco products or oral nicotine products which is not tobacco. So that's a cellulose fibre that's then had nicotine added to it. So no tobacco in there. Snus alone uh, created the Swedish experiences or experiment experience, as we call it, that reduced smoking to very, very low levels. Then along comes vaping, heated tobacco products and oral nicotine products, and now they're at 5.8%. They have 30 years of epidemiological evidence showing Sweden has the lowest rates of heart disease, the lowest rates of lung cancer, the lowest rates, all these smoking-related diseases. And that was the proof that providing people with a lower-risk product works. But in New Zealand, and I was uh, when I was chair of In Smoking NZ and we were lobbying for SNUS to be legalised here, We were constantly told, oh, but Sweden is different. Culturally, it's different from New Zealand. New Zealanders won't won't take to snus. They're not going to want to put a little tea bag up under their lip. Uh, I think that the success we have had with vaping, that we are now at, at, uh, we've six point, is it 6.8% smoking prevalence? We're right on, you know, Sweden was going to get to 5% way before everybody else. And suddenly, and it feels very sudden, we are there. We're right there on their tail. And this December, when the ministry puts out the stats, we could be at 5%. So could Sweden. I mean, they're a little bit ahead of us. Had to do it with these bizarre things that the Labour Party we're trying to push through to us. You know, we're with low nicotine tobacco, which doesn't exist anywhere in the world. Uh, it, it does. There's a company called, a tobacco company uh, called Century 21, and many companies before have tried to produce a low nicotine cigarette. They've always failed at market. People try them and go, well, yeah, that that's, it doesn't work. <laughs> And so they fail at market. So if you put it out on the market, people buy it. They're not going to buy it again. And so Century 21, uh, they have a product. And in fact, some of our tobacco control researchers have met with this tobacco company. I thought that was wrong, you know, but and lobbied for them. Does that talk about big tobacco being evil and then meeting yep. Oh. They, met, they met, met with Sent 221, have done research on the products and have lobbied the government to give Century 21, a US tobacco company who also sell combustible cigarettes yeah. uh, and maybe cigars, I think. Uh, to, and these academics, the very ones against 
vaping products have lobbied the New Zealand government, the Labour government, to give the Century 21 a monopoly contract for supply. And they went ahead and, and, the gover- and they did it. The Labour government passed that law. What's the science? I mean, the, the clear, there's clear science and evidence about uh, heated tobacco products, as you've talked about, Japan and Korea. There's clear science out of Sweden. You've produced a report recently that shows that the reduction of harm approach has been successful in New Zealand without the need for prohibition or anything like that. We're almost at 5%, which is, you know, that's the goal. Surely we could get over that goal if we introduced, you know, oral nicotine products and and made those easily available like like Zin, which I use. Oh. Right? I mean, I can't smoke cigars in my apartment building, but I can keep my nicotine levels high using Zin. The the excuse that Kiwis won't put a little tea bag under their lip is 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 bollocks. The American uh, experience of oral tobacco, uh, oral nicotine products shows that that people readily change from uh, using cigarettes or cigars or pipes to oral nicotine products. You know, even you know, famous podcasters uh, have talked about it. You know, on their show uh, about using these products, and they even talk about wall rusting. Right? Yeah, you've heard that, but that's two pouches, one on each side. Yes, I I don't know how anyone can do that because even the three milligram uh, uh, ones that I use give you a, an instantaneous, you know, nicotine hit within about within about three or four minutes. And like you, there's no way you could keep them in there for 15, 20 minutes. You know, like you seriously get knocked about. Um, well, that, yeah, that's why we have to have a range of products mm. uh, because different people are different and um, they like different flavours. They, they need, you know, they like a different strength and they like a different experience. And I think that the current government is on the right track Uh so we we were sitting at the end of um, December 23, uh, 6.8%. Wow. And, and we've done that. Uh, vaping has, you know, the government itself says in its cabinet paper, they've created this rapid drop in smoking prevalence, uh, you know, from, I mean, 2019, it was at, say, 12%, 119 so 12%. And we are down in just, what is that, 2019, five years, we're down to 6.8%. This is this is unheard of. This is like a dream come true for me to see such rapid reduction in smoking prevalence. It allowed, you know, vape shops or heated tobacco to be advertised. Imagine we'd be, we'd be below 5% now if, if they'd been advertised and instead of it all being secret squirrel. I think, yeah, and the other thing is that the misinformation about nicotine, the misinformation about uh, vaping products, pushed by University of Otago academics, Asthma and Respiratory Foundation, uh, the uh, you know the um, Cancer Society, these public health groups, um, many you know some of them directly funded by pharmaceutical companies the competition because they have the nicotine replacement products and cessation medications and their sales have gone through the floor. They they are losing, you know, they've lost so much income from their own nicotine products. And, yeah, so the misinformation and my research is bearing that out as well, it's putting people off vaping, even though they put off vaping and they hear all of these horror stories and, you know, reefer type madness about vaping. Yeah, isn't it? Schools are all, ba- oh, kids are smoking, uh, are, are bringing vapes to school. So what? Do you mm. want to bring cigarettes to school like we used to? Yeah, Asthma and Respiratory Foundation targeted schools, principals and teachers uh, with a whole program to manipulate their knowledge on the topic. And uh, so they created this real panic among parents and schools and teachers and uh, so you have these so-called public health groups that are leading these misinformation campaigns. Um, 
and that is doing a lot of damage. We would have been we would have been below five percent now if they had not put out just blatant lies. And then we also have a lot of researchers around the world who have fallen into believing this and who are creating, you know, some of the papers I read, not only are they scientifically flawed, they're just blatantly uh, misled or deliberately written to mislead uh, everybody about the relative risk of these products compared to smoking. That's, that's what I mentioned before about Dr. Jude Ball from Otago University. She's horrified that we're going to legalise oral nicotine products because they're connected with tobacco industry interests. And if you point out to her, now hang on a second, isn't that better than smoking? And nicotine, whilst it's addictive, is actually beneficial, and I'm proof of that. And her response was, to label nicotine as an insecticide, which is actually a lie because what she's talking about, you know, she, she quotes this thing from Science Direction, nicotine has moderate to high toxicity for all vertebrates. Nicotine kills insects rapidly, often within an hour. Well, how's that relevant? It's not even <laughs> talking about it. It's neonicotinoids, which are similar, but it's not what's in vapes or pouches. So she's a public health expert who's using her academic freedom to spread misinformation and nobody does anything. Yeah, I don't I don't think that she actually knows the truth. I think that, you know, and, and I can speak from experience. I've been in that bubble. It's it's a tightly controlled sector. Uh, you are fed information and you are not allowed to read research that is outside of of the kind of you know, what academic freedom is all about isn't it no there's no such thing as academic freedom that's been gone for a long time and uh you know so even i can look back and and look at things that i used to say and i I've, I've learned that they were wrong you know like uh, uh what was it a nic- nicotine there were lots of things I would say about nicotine, uh, that 50 milligrams would kill an elephant. I, that's what I was taught. And okay. then I went to a conference. This is, uh, you know, in recent and say the last decade, go to a conference and there's some presenter showing that they went back through all the research. Where did this 50 milligrams is the lethal dose? Where did that come from? They went back all the way through into the late 1800s where a doctor experimented on himself. How much nicotine would it take to, you know, to kill a person? And estimated, once he couldn't take any more or whatever, he estimated 50 milligrams. It's not even based on a scientific study. A doctor said it. The other thing that uh, this researcher who was presenting had done is look at suicides and attempted murders or actual murders where nicotine had been used. So this is a really bizarre like harm that that occurs from putting out a message like nicotine is a poison and the lethal dose is this. So so people go, okay, lethal dose is that. I'm going to stick patches all over this person while they're asleep or, and then this has actually been done. People have tried to kill people. (laughs) <laughs> and people have tried to kill themselves by overdosing on nicotine. And so he looked at all of those incidents where people had died uh, and how much nicotine had they ingested to achieve that end. It is in the hundreds, not 50 milligrams. So I don't think that Jude knows the truth. Uh, you... I don't like to use the word cult because there are some seriously bad, you know, cults in the world, but there were definitely cult-like features in tobacco control and in the public health conferences that I went to where you'd have a charismatic speaker, you know, talking about the evil of nicotine and using slides 
that are completely unrelated from World War II Nazi Germany mm-hmm. and barbed wire and uh, uh, just these. I'm sitting there, you know, my background was psychology, and I'm going, hang on a minute, this is like blatant psyops, you know, mm-hmm. having a completely unrelated, horrific picture behind what he's saying. And I'm like, wow, this is like brainwashing. I'm looking around and everyone was transfixed. Mm. And all I could do, I just sat there and just wrote down what was happening because it was so shocking. And if you say anything, you question you know, question the ideology that we're supposed to prescribe to, uh, believe, uh, then, yeah, you get Māori, but you, you are cancelled. You, you will be run out of your job. You will never get funding again. You will be cancelled on Reality Check Radio, that's for sure. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I mean, Anu Wa from the University of Auckland, I got this information under Official Information Act. He contacted research, human research ethics committees to lobby none, to lobby them to never give me ethics approval for any of my research. This is the lengths they go to. It's unprofessional and it's unethical and it's censorship. Well, we, we're totally against that. We're coming up against time, uh, Mariwa, but you're, you're an expert. Uh, what would you uh, recommend for a long-term smoker who wants to quit? What, should, what, what, what would work for them? Um, well, actually, in my current study, many of them don't want to quit, and that is something that isn't recognised as well. So the tobacco control sector puts out that 75% of people want to quit. 70, you know, a majority regret that they ever started. But what is overlooked is that there are a percentage who don't want to quit. They're quite happy. One of our um, elderly women in our Voices of the 5% study, and we have a website called Voices of the 5%, I'm putting all their case stories up there, open for anyone to read. And I really hope people do because you need to understand what people's lives are, why they smoke, and they might try and quit. But then, like one of our guys, you know, his partner tried to hang herself and he sent the kids down to <laughs> to her house that so they found, you know, real traumas are happening to people. So um, the elderly woman, she said to us, she's in a rest home, you know, she's got her own villa. Um, if she didn't have smoking, this is when they were bringing in the denicotinization, you know, denicotinized cigarettes. And she was like, if I don't have this, I don't see any point in my in living. And going on, it was it was the most rewarding thing she had in her life left. And there are a lot of old people who are just discarded um, to the margins. I can understand that. You know, after I had my stroke, I basically didn't do anything for two years except sit on the you know my deck chair and watch the tide go in and out. And, you know, because I really didn't have any energy to do anything else. And so I sat there and smoked cigars. And when you smoke a cigar, it takes an hour or more, depending on the size of the cigar or whatever, but it's definitely more than an hour. And I found that to be really relaxing and really pleasant to just sit there and contemplate the world whilst, you know, intermittently moving the cigar up to my mouth and and tasting the cigar and and it was a time for me to detoxify myself from society. I made sure my phone was off. I made sure I, there was nothing but sounds of nature around me as I sat there and contemplated everything. Yeah. It slowed me down. And I can understand what that lady's talking about. You know, she is, uses smoking as a contemplative, almost a meditative. A friend. Form. It's yeah. a friend. And, and that's, you know, one of her only thing, you know, we don't, many of us have no idea of the loneliness that um, many elderly people live with mm. and the loss loss of purpose. We have one guy who suffered a, a, a brain injury from an accident and the loss of purpose. And uh, he said, oh, I'll go and do this and 
I'll, I'll go to the shop and and I'll do you know tend to my tomatoes, and then I'll um, take some sleeping pills because I've got nothing to do, got nothing to do, and so you know. What's really important for people is having a purpose and all of those wonderful things we need as humans, friends, involvement, a role in society, and we discard these peoples to the margins through poverty, they can't afford to do anything, and through discrimination and just, you know, age discrimination. We take away their purpose. They have no role anymore and no friends. So I really want people to understand why people smoke. If someone is a long-term smoker and they want to quit, then what a lot of our participants did, and we we researched and surveyed people who didn't want to quit or didn't believe they would be able to quit by 2025. We've been following them for three, nearly four years, and even among people who in 2020 did not did not see themselves ever stopping smoking and or and there's thirty percent don't want to they they don't want to and they haven't they haven't they're not even interested in vaping, but many others did try vaping, and then there's lots of barriers why it doesn't work for some people, and it's a it's an off ramp you go kind of you're on the motorway some people are in the fast lane they're nowhere near the exit lane. And the ones on the exit lane, and they take they take the off ramp. They both smoke and vape, and they could do that for a year, two years. And then, for some people, it's a slow change. For others, it's fast. Everyone's different. And then they manage to cut down. So Bob, one of our participants, he is down to one skinny racehorse. So that's he breaks cigarettes down. And can roll four or five out of one cigarette. Oh, that's some skill. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and he's down to one a day, and and that for me is a fantastic, you know, achievement for him. He's vaping a lot, but he just one a day. From I, I think he stu- he entered the study four years ago. He was already vaping, but he was smoking about four, five, four, five, maybe six uh, skinny racehorses a day. So you, you're talking about one cigarette ripped down into, say, four racehorses, and he already had reduced his harm a lot by doing even that, but he's still, you know, trying to get rid of that last one, uh, but he can't, and, and I'm proud of him. It's probably, you know, um, entertaining in breaking <laughs> breaking down a cigarette and seeing how many resources you can make out of it, you know. <laughs> that, I couldn't yeah. even try to, to do that. It would be too hard, you know. And think of the time involved. And, and this is another thing I've learned from all of these wonderful people across New Zealand who have has stuck with us for four years while we – just we're just asking how's it going, you know, every now and then. And uh, they, one of the things I've learned is the indignity that these policies impose upon people. Um, you know, everyone has got something better to do than sitting there ripping apart a cigarette and making resources, right? That's time, or. Uh, there was one horrible case you might have seen some time back where this man thought, oh, cigarette butts are disappearing from my ashtray on my deck. So mm. he put a camera and he caught this Māori woman coming at like 2 o'clock in the morning to steal cigarette butts. That little bit of tobacco it's, that's left over. Yeah, you can buy bags of cigarette butts, you know, on Facebook for $10, a big bag of of cigarette butts, and then people will rip them apart. And, you know, this is an indignity. And I think really the indignity, the people who are acting undignified are public health by creating these circumstances that force people to find cigarettes that way. And even recently 
Uh, my partner Steve and I were down at the supermarket and a Māori woman came up. Māori have higher smoking rates. <laughs> Overrepresented among lower social. She comes up to him and uh, he was vaping actually and she said, have you got a cigarette? And he's like, no, I, I don't smoke cigarettes. And she's like, please, I'll do 10 push-ups for you. Yeah. It's like, oh, you know, like we've really lost public health have – lost an understanding they don't understand people's lives the circumstances that lead them to use products that relieve the stress and the the trauma the pain um and they don't care they don't care anymore and uh and it's a real a real loss i think public health you know you just got to scale it back to its basics, make sure that water is clean, make sure that restaurants are not serving contaminated food, get back to the basics and get back to understanding. Trying to control lives. Yeah. We're there to help people. If they want help, you can, yep, okay, lead, lead paint was bad. Okay, come on. Can't be that bad. There's a whole generation chewed on um, yeah, and pencils. Yeah, pencils with lead paint in them, and and you know cots and toys that were covered in lead paint didn't hurt us really, did it? Yeah, but let the market innovate. Let the market come up with solutions. There and, are let the market advertise those solutions so that we can reduce. I mean, smoking is awful. It's a horrible um, habit, really. Um, but no one in New Zealand now can say, well, we weren't told, right? We, we all know. We all know what the health effects are of smoking. Um, but if people choose to do that, I mean, I'm a bit of a libertarian. If people choose to do that and harm themselves, it's up to them. They pay tax for the privilege of it. So, you know, that, that's really where it should be left now. If we get under 5% and we're almost there, we, you're right, we should move on to let's tackle obesity now. Or let's tackle the next thing that's causing problems. Yeah, that's right. Um, the I don't like the um, compartmentalization of public health. So you have like these, this group only do smoking, and you know, they do the lungs, they do the cervix, they do the kidney. You know, uh, as a public health professor, and when I was a policy analyst, you we had to look at. All of the diseases, which is the one killing the most people, which is the one that's causing, you know, the most harm for the most people, and we had to prioritise. And in that first year with Helen Clark uh, bought in the Smoke Free Environments Act, set up the Public Health Commission 1993, and she's, this is what we had to do as the Public Health Commission, and we had to prioritise 10, 10, and write policy advice for her on that. Uh, and that kind of knowledge and expertise as, you know, how to analyse policy, how, how governments need to work. There's not an endless bucket of money. You know, you, you must prioritise. You also have to talk with stakeholders. You also have to bring the public along. Mm -hmm. And that's all being whittled down and lost. Now it's like, well, no, we told you smoking kills. You didn't stop, so we're just going to make you stop. And that isn't, um, that's, as I said, it's a breach of human rights and it's not what New Zealand used to be. Well, we need to go back to that. And on that note, Mari Wiglover, thank you very much for coming on the show. And I'm definitely going to come back when you get some more research that comes out because it's a fascinating chat, that's for sure. Thank you, Cam. And it's been really great to uh, to talk with you about this topic and thank you so much for inviting me on your show. I don't get very many invites because I'm cancelled, um, but I have so much work to do anyway. I, you know, yeah, but you're not cancelled here. We thank you all views. And I just hope that some of these public health people that are out there will climb off their high horse and talk to me. Um, you know, where I can ask them, well, what about the evidence of Japan? What about the evidence of Korea? What about the evidence of Sweden? Uh, and put those questions to them so that they can tell us what their working is. Yeah, U USA, Norway, Iceland, uh, Russia. There are so many countries now that are going this way, and and the evidence is it's almost 
overwhelming. So the fact that Australia can do what they're doing in the face of international experience, um, the lack of evidence for what they're doing, um, it, it's amazing. It's it's a weird phenomenon. We're in weird times. We are indeed, and thank you very much. Okay, thanks. There were some amazing revelations in that interview. First, that some public health advocates are working cap in hand with a big American tobacco company and trying to get policy and succeeded influence through the Labour Party and that those same public health officials are actually propagandists and political operatives with a tame MP in the guise of Aisha Verrill. Watch them come for us now for daring to have a yarn with Dr Glover. Tell me what you think, email inbox at realitycheck.radio or text to 2057. Thank you for tuning in to RCR Reality Check Radio. If you like what you're listening to, just like what you're listening to. Either way, we want to hear from you. Get in touch with us now. You can text us with your message to 2057. That's 2057. Or email us at inbox at realitycheck.radio. We would love to hear from you, so connect with us today.